Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday Easter service. Grateful for all of you who are with us here this morning and those who are live streaming at home. Uh, last year, I, I was here alone. It was just me and the AVO and the worship team and Wayne. And so, man, when I yelled, he has risen, it felt lonely. <laughs> so thank you for being here this morning. My heart is full to be gathered with God's people to celebrate the risen Savior. He, he's a living hope, the resurrected Christ. All other hopes are dying in this one is a living hope, and we gather to celebrate it. A uh, special thank you to all uh, who made that pancake breakfast happen. I just want to thank you guys. That was sweet. As was, as was mentioned, we're going to be celebrating a life of one of the sweetest saints I've come to know in my journey, Jeannie Tiffany, and that'll be this Saturday. And the family's asked um, that we would all wear masks. So um, I would like for you to love and honor that family and come and remember Jeannie and, and to mask up for them. Many of you gathered with me on Friday night and we went to the Garden of Gethsemane and we looked at that time when the cup was put before Jesus, the Son of God, of what he would have to drink to be a, a punishment for our sins. And he looked into it with terror and he prayed that the cup might pass. Uh, if there's any other way, but not my will, but your will be done, Father. He was submissive to his Father. He would go to Calvary and he would drink every last drop of wrath for our sins. And the Father did not quit punishing him until all was poured out for the sins that we've done. And so the good news of the gospel is there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then we went to the table to remember and the, the fellowship was so rich afterwards. And now this morning, we're going to come to the third day where some of Jesus' followers now come to the tomb and the stone is rolled away. And the angel tells them he's not there. He's risen just as he said. And so the question is, what does that mean? What does that mean 2,000 years later as you sit here in this room that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead? That is what I hope to answer this morning. Should that event impact my life at all? Can it change me? Can it save me from sin and from God? Can it bring me back into a relationship with God this very day and forevermore in glory? After a year like 2020, where deceit abounded in so many areas in our own country, truth became hard to find. So what I want to give to you this morning is just God's undiluted truth about the significance of His Son. Uh, how you respond to him, I want you to hear this, will affect your eternity. What you do with the Son of God will affect whether we spend eternal life with him in heaven or eternal wrath with him in hell. There are two destinations. And so I promise to not beat around the bush, to not put a velvet cloth around a brick. I'm going to tell you with judgment day honesty what God's truth says about all of this. And I'm not trying to be popular. I'm not after you liking me this morning. I'm not running for office. I just want to be faithful to God to tell you the truth, no more and no less. And I pray that it will bless you to have someone tell you the truth and to do it in love and not be mean-spirited as our day and age is, just wanting your good and your eternal blessing before God. So may he meet us this morning and reveal the Son of God in all his glory to every heart in this place. So let's go to our God and ask him to meet us in a very special way. Father, we come before you for one reason only, because our, our Savior went to a cross and died in our place and was buried and was raised in complete victory. He accomplished salvation. The veil is torn in two. We have full access now to you through Christ. And so we come gladly and, and, and wholeheartedly this morning to you. And I pray now, God, as we unfold this word, your word, would you work in every heart and that Jesus would be Lord of every heart in this room. God, do what no human being can do and work in each life specifically and individually. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you're visiting our commitment here at Southside as we preach verse by verse through books of the Bible, it's called exegesis. We try to draw out the truth of God's word instead of importing what we want it to say or think it should say. It's 
What does God's word say? And so it's really easy for me to pick a sermon every Sunday. I just go to the next section and it's there for me and I don't even have to think about it. So when these special days come upon us like Easter and I try to find a passage to preach on, it can be quite difficult. I'm unpracticed at it. And I, I, this one, I usually know two months before and I knew two days before. So I wrestled and wrestled. I spent a lot of time praying and studying. And I would get a passage and look at it and be like, no, that's not it. And, and finally, right up to my deadline, uh, here's where I landed. And I, I feel good about it. And I hope when I'm done that you guys do too. If you, if you don't, I'll try again next Easter. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I have this, I love stories and pictures. And I learn best by seeing them and understanding them and then seeing the truth that comes out of that. You know, allegory, parables, typology, where the, the story of everyday events of people <clears throat> paint you a picture of, of something greater than the picture itself. It's called type anti-type. And, and you look at, let's just take an example of the Passover where, where they were told to put blood over the doorpost and the, the death angel came and passed over those houses and the firstborn were not killed. And so it's this beautiful thing that happened in history of what God wanted to paint a picture of. And later Jesus Christ would come and be called the Passover lamb. He's the anti-type. And now when his blood is on you, the wrath of God's going to pass over and you're going to be accepted and brought into his presence. And so that's kind of type, anti-type stuff we're looking at. And that's what I would like to do this morning. The type that I was overcome with as I was studying is the life of Joseph. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher, said, we never need to strain the narrative to see the picture of Christ by the life of Joseph. One of the most natural typologies, I think, in the Bible. So I want to show you the beauty of the resurrection this morning through the life of Joseph. And I might be the only pastor in America doing that this morning, so I don't know if that's good or not. Well, you tell me at the end. I'm kind of excited to talk with you afterwards. My prayer is that I'll be able to show you the beauty of the mighty salvation that God has brought in the greater Joseph, Jesus Christ. A greater salvation than the earthly rescue that Joseph brought to his people at a time during a very severe famine. And what's cool is it's just so intriguing. It's a beautiful story. Uh, movies and plays have been made from this. <clears throat> it should be easy to follow and somewhat enjoyable. But the application of it will make clear in your minds, why did Jesus come into this world and die and be resurrected? And, and so let's come now and journey together and look at that beauty at the end. So where I'd like to begin is, who is Joseph? In Genesis 37, we meet young Joseph. He was born from, uh, his father was Jacob. And so you have God in the beginning of the Bible where he, he calls out Abraham. And he calls him to leave his land and his people and to go to a place that he's going to prepare for them. Later, it'll be a land flowing with milk and honey. There'll be great blessing and a nation that would come from his seed. And so you, you, you watch Abraham journey and then he has a son named Isaac who happened to be born to him when he was 100 years old and his wife was 90, not the most prime years to have children. And then Jake, Isaac has twins, and it's Jacob and Esau. And Jacob, this long journey, he receives the blessing to be the one that the promise that God said he would bring a seed to bring salvation would come through. And so Jacob has 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. And there's a long story, but Jacob wants to marry Rachel, and she was beautiful, and he had a father-in-law named Laban, and he serves him for seven years, and Laban tricks him, and he sends his oldest daughter, Leah, uh, on the wedding night, and the Bible just says she was weak of eyes. We don't know what it means. It, it appears she was unattractive, and he felt cheated, so he serves seven more years, and then Laban finally gives him his daughter, Rachel, and 12 sons now are born to Jacob. Ten to Leah and their concubines, and two to Rachel. The two youngest that, that Rachel had were Joseph and Benjamin. And so Joseph was the favored child. Benjamin came later. He was very spoiled as my guest. Jacob was anointed his son. He gave him a beautiful coat. You've heard of that, Joseph's coat of many colors. It's famous even today. Genesis 37, 4 says this. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and couldn't speak to him on friendly terms. So because he's favored, the rest of the siblings hate him. 
They, they can't stand Joseph. And it's just a common response by siblings to a favored one in a family. I see it on a daily basis. It's a toxic love that can poison a whole family, and, and, and it poisoned Joseph. Joseph would have these dreams, and there were stalks of grain, and he said they, they're all bowing down to him to worship him. And then there are these stars, and they're all bowing down to him. And it, it seemed like he, he liked telling these dreams to the brothers, you're all going to bow down to me and worship me. And so you guys want to hear my dream that I had last night? Let me share with you. And I'll tell you, that's not the best way to build relationship with your older brothers. <laughs> So one day the sons are sent out by Jacob to take the sheep to graze in Shechem. And later the father sends Joseph, go check on them. And, and the Bible says it just so happened. And that's this whole narrative. What I want you to see this morning is this is God painting a narrative through history. I, you should just bow down and worship a God who can paint a narrative with people as they're acting out exactly what he wants. And so the brothers went to Dothan a very remote place. And Joseph comes to where his brothers were supposed to be, and they're not there. And he met a stranger who overheard the brothers and say that they were going to Dothan. So Joseph goes off to find them, and the brothers see him coming at a distance, and they say, let's kill him. And so they, they throw him into a water system, cistern, and they sit down and eat lunch, the cold-heartedness of the whole thing. And it just so happens that some Ishmaelites are traveling by. And Judah says, why should we kill Joseph? Let's get something for him. And they sold him for 20 pieces of silver into slavery. And they took his coat and they smeared it with animal's blood. And then they go back and they take it to his father. And they said, Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. And Jacob goes into complete despair, tears out his hair and falls to the ground. And his sons just sit and watch him grieve. Surely, Jacob says, I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. And he wept for him. Then Genesis now just focuses in on the life of Joseph. And he had to deal with the deep, deep hurt of what his brothers did, the separation from his beloved father. And Joseph now is taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar is an Egyptian officer to Pharaoh, the highest ruler in the land, the captain of the bodyguard, and he buys him from the Ishmaelites to be his slave. And the Lord is with Joseph. Everywhere Joseph goes, he blossoms and prospers. And he becomes the personal servant in this home and the overseer of Potiphar's whole house. A great blessing flowed on this house because of Joseph. And then we're told that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. I'm looking for an illustration. <laughs> and Potiphar's wife says it looks on Joseph with desire and she tries to make passes at him and come after him. And he refuses her and says, how could I do this sin against God? And he flees. And she's embittered and she lies about him that he tried to come on to her and, and told her husband this lie. And Potiphar's anger burns against Joseph and has him put in jail. And he's put in jail very unjustly for being righteous. Joseph now is put into the dungeon. It doesn't go well for Joseph. He ends up in the dungeon. He spends 13 years in this prison. And finally, Pharaoh is having these confusing dreams. Seven fat cows and skinny cows. And he just, he can't figure it out. And they're haunting him. And he's told by some people that Joseph is an interpreter of dreams. He knows he has a God who can help interpret. And he comes and he interprets the dream. And he tells them that dream is that we're going to have seven years of abundance in the land and then seven years of severe famine. And you need to stockpile then in those seven years all the food so we'll get through the famine. And so Joseph then is promoted to be prime minister and he's in charge of the whole famine project. This is his resurrection from the dead. He's in a pit and a dungeon and now he's raised up to great power. He's at the right hand of the highest power in the land. So by what Joseph did... He saved many lives in the time of famine for Egypt and for many surrounding areas that would come and buy grain so they wouldn't starve and die. <laughs> the famine was great in the land and his family as well, the Israelites, had been affected. So Jacob now sends his other sons to go to Egypt to buy grain, except Benjamin, his favorite son, who he can't have him die like Joseph. And I want you to listen what happens when they show up to Egypt and Joseph sees them. It's been 22 years since they sold him into slavery. And Joseph recognizes the brothers, but they don't recognize him. 
And he accuses them of being spies to spy out their land. Uh, I was talking to Sweezy before service. And he goes, man, it's just like Joseph just toyed with these guys and played with them. And I said, that's what I would have done to my brothers. <laughs> and he says, no, you're spies. And they're like, we're not spies. We are 12 brothers from Canaan and our father's still alive. And our youngest brother's with our father and the other's dead. And Joseph says, well, let's test out your story. Bring your youngest brother here. <clears throat> leave one, I'll leave one of you in prison and bring back your youngest brother to make sure you're telling the truth. And the brother said, truly we're guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not listen to him. Long story short, they go back and tell Jacob what the ruler of Egypt had said. And Jacob says, never. And he cries out that famous cry, all these things are against me. And after two years of trying to survive the drought, Jacob finally realizes we're going to die anyways. So go back with Benjamin. Benjamin. And when they show up with Benjamin, Joseph runs out of the room and he starts to weep. And Joseph uh, says, this is good. Tomorrow you guys will come and feast with me at my table. And then he gives them the grain and blesses them and they leave for home now, ready to take care of their family in the time of famine. But Joseph's bodyguards come upon them and said, you stole my master's silver cup. And they say, if you find the cup, the one that would have it shall die and we'll all be your slaves. And they search the bag and they find it in Benjamin's sack, which they had put in there. Bring them back to Joseph. Uh, not, not all be my slaves. I'm just going to have one. It'll be Benjamin. And now the brothers can get rid of the other favorite son and get their own freedom and be done with all this. But Judah, one of the brothers stands up and shares what Benjamin means to Jacob. And this would kill our father. Let me remain here and let the boy return. And so Joseph breaks and he tells the court and all the people, go out, go out. And he tells his brothers who he is, and he weeps so loud that the whole place can hear him. He says, I'm Joseph. How is our father doing? You just dream of situations like this, of those who have wronged you. And Joseph now has them, and he says, come closer. Draw near, and he shows them love and kindness and tells them he has no grudge. They're forgiven. And he sees God's hand in all of it in Genesis 50, 20. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to preserve a nation alive during this famine. And he sends for Jacob and he brings them to Goshen, this land of peace and prosperity and blessing. And they live happy, united for 17 years. And then Jacob dies. Joseph had taken care of the whole family and loved them for all those years. Joseph saved his family from a certain death in the time of famine. One of the great stories of all time. And yet it's God's story. And this should take your breath away, again, that God can take history and paint a portrait through everyday historical events and happenings of Jesus Christ. And so what I would like to do now is I want to look at the antitype, the antitype of Joseph. And Joseph pointed to something greater than himself. And what is that? Well, Joseph was beloved by his father. The love that the father had for Jesus was perfect and eternal. He said, you were daily my delight. There's never been a greater love in all the history of the world. Everything pales in comparison to the love that the father had for his son, Jesus Christ. Joseph was hated by his brothers. And Jesus' his own family hated him and rejected him. They were jealous of him. We see thousands of years in the history of our Bibles of God setting his love upon the nation of Israel. You only have I known Israel. You only have I chosen and set my love upon you of all the nations. His hesedness, this covenantal faithfulness and loyalty that God had to Israel through the whole Testament. His promise to them to bring them a savior that a, a Messiah would come from your seed, a salvation. Uh, he'll save you from your sin and from your enemies. And when Jesus came, his own did not receive him. In John 1.11, it says he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. The religious of the day were jealous of him because the father loved him and spoke against them. And he called them to bow down to him and worship and receive him in salvation. And his own family rejected him. They rejected the Messiah that they had waited for thousands of years when he came. Joseph was thrown into a pit in a dungeon and left for dead. And they said, our brother is dead. 
Their jealousy and envy led them to get rid of Joseph. And as we watch the Gospels unfold, the Jews did the exact same thing to Jesus. They gnashed their teeth and they tore their garments at him. And they would not rest until he was put on a cross and left for dead. And he would hang on a cross in the same cheap coins that Judas sold him for. He was thrown in prison for righteousness with Potiphar's wife. And he was unjustly treated. The story bears it out so powerfully. And the most unjust death in the history of the world was Jesus Christ. They broke all jurors' prudence and the, the way they rigged up the trials and faked it. Even to where Pilate finally at the end just says, I, I see no guilt in this man. We want, we want Barabbas. Crucify him. Away with him. And he's led away to die a shameful death as the most righteous, innocent one who ever walked this earth. And the crime that they came up with on his cross was the king of the Jews. As Joseph received a resurrection out from his death and dungeon and pit, he was given new life in our story. He was brought to a place of authority where he could preserve the lives of many in the time of famine. Joseph would ascend to the right hand of the most powerful being at the time, Pharaoh. And a multitude would be spared and saved from the famine that swept the land. And his family would be brought into Goshen, into this place now of safety. My friends, Jesus was hated by his own and he was rejected. Jealousy and hatred of his message. We will not bow and worship you. He went into his own dungeon called the cross so that he could save his own. The one that the Father has given him before the foundation of the world. Not just to save their lives, but to save their eternal souls. And he went under the wrath of God for the soul that sins must die. And he bore God's justice on the cross for the evil that we have, been, we have done by treating God as if he doesn't matter and have lacked his glory. We've not treasured God. Sin is not treasuring God for who he is. And Jesus went up on a cross and he bore the wrath for all of our sin. One had to go before us to save us from God's wrath. That's about to be poured out on this whole world as the world's unfolding and coming to an end. This Joseph didn't go into a dungeon, but he voluntarily went to the cross and he went up on it and he hung on it and he became the bullseye of God's wrath for our sins, for his brothers and sisters. So that we could be forgiven of every sin that we've ever committed. And we could be saved and brought back to the Father to dwell in Goshen the rest of our days in peace and shalom and safety in the presence of God. The safest place in the world is to be in Christ. And we, we dwell where there's no condemnation and we have the love and the grace of God. And he would die as our substitute and he would breathe his last and he would be laid in a tomb and three days later, three days later, he would rise. As Joseph rose again in power to save a people from death, so up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He is no longer in the grave. He rose and he's seated at the right hand of God this morning. And now he's able to save to the uttermost all who will draw near to God through him. Now his fruits are to gather in the nations, every tribe, tongue, and nation, and people who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So, what do we do with this? What do we do with the resurrection? I'll tell you this morning, I want you to catch, don't miss this piece. We need to see Jesus. We need to have him reveal himself to us. And so let us look at how Joseph revealed himself to his brothers and kind of finish up this type. And we'll close out in prayer. I want you to listen to Genesis 45, 1 through 7. As Joseph manifested to his brothers who he was. 
Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him as brothers, and he cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers couldn't answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there's still five more years in which there'll be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. I'm going to deliver you from this famine and bondage that is coming. So just a couple thoughts on this as we close. And I'm going to borrow from Spurgeon because he's the only guy I could find that preached on this. Sorry, guys. I see some principles here of how the Lord reveals himself to us. And so I want you to just wake up. Judgment day honesty. Here's where we need to deal with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First, Joseph knew his brothers and they didn't know him. Jesus knows his sheep. He says they hear my voice. And he desires to reveal himself to us. Joseph wept. Jesus' loving heart desires to bridge the gulf of manifesting himself to you this morning. You're stumbling in darkness. Proverbs say you don't even know what you're stumbling over. You're like a man in darkness, just stumbling, trying to figure out life, the next thing that will help. And you're just going from one thing to the next, and maybe you've come here this morning with that on your mind. But you don't know Jesus. He desires to reveal himself. Matthew 11, whoever he wishes to reveal himself, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your souls. That might be why you've been led here this morning. I just want you to hear this so clearly. The great need of your life is to see Jesus. And I've been praying that he would manifest himself to you this morning. Open my eyes, Lord, I want to see Jesus. Not religion, not moral cleanup, Today you need to see a resurrected Christ who is able to save to all who will come. Secondly, Jesus, like Joseph, reveals himself in private for the most part. Have everyone go out from me so they would be alone as he reveals himself. And I want to encourage you to get alone with God this day and open up your scriptures and say, is this true? And pray until you see him dying for your sins, putting them away and God receiving you. In the quietness of your heart this morning, I ask that you would receive Jesus. And thirdly, just an observation, the first revelation can come with terror. I'm Joseph, and it says they were dismayed at his presence. You know what that means? (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. I'm the one... I'm the one that you sold for dead. And now I'm, I'm sitting here in power to kill you or not. Uh-oh. Now you see who he is. He's the resurrected Christ in all authority here this morning. What have you done with him? That old song that says it was my sin that held him there. Your sin is great. And before God, you're you're in trouble if you stand before him in your sin. You're troubled by all that you've seen and heard maybe this morning. And I've heard this so many times. Maybe you're sitting here going, he can't save me. I'm too far gone. And I'm telling you that is the biggest lie you could ever say. So maybe you're a little dismayed. But the second revelation brings the greatest joy possible. I'm Joseph please come closer to me. You're grieved for your sin against me, the brothers, but I was sent before you to preserve life. Jesus says, come near. Come near, sinner. I'm the friend of sinners. I've come to save 
sinners, not the righteous. Though your sins were as scarlet, they'll be made as white as snow. Jesus says, God, the Father, will remember your sins no more. The blood will wash away the sin. Draw near to God through Jesus Christ. Come near and believe and trust Christ for salvation. Please hear this this morning. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, the head over the whole church, Lord of Lord and King of Kings, says to you this morning, I'm your brother. Come near and be saved and have your sins separated as far as the east is from the west. Be not grieved that you sold me for the world. Come this morning and draw near and I'll forgive you. I'm your brother. And you will live in Goshen. You will have peace with God and you will stand in the grace and favor of Almighty God. That's the gospel. That's his resurrection. He is risen and he has all authority now on earth and heaven. And he's endowed with salvation to all who will come to him and believe in him and trust him and surrender to him. May he reveal himself to you this day. And as Joseph rose up from the pit and the dungeon, so our greater Joseph is lying in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb and he's dead. And three days later, they come and the stones rolled away and they say, he's not here. He has risen just as he said. Up from the grave he arose. And he offers this great salvation for any who will come and believe. Amen. So I close with my favorite part of the service. And this has been hitting me more than ever. This isn't a fable. This isn't just something you come and get excited about. This is the greatest reality there is, is that tomb is empty. And that's, that cup was drained and there is salvation in no other. And so I want you to take that in. And this is the greatest truth and reality of your life this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, he is risen indeed. Hear the bells ringing. They're singing that you can be born again. God, I pray. Jesus, anyone whom you wish, reveal yourself this morning. Let them hear this glorious gospel and glorious truth. There's a way to have your sins forgiven and dwell with God for all of eternity. Oh God, let them hear this morning. Jesus, shine. Holy Spirit, your role, turn on the floodlights. Let them look at Jesus and see a Savior this morning. Let no one run back to self, run back to sin, run back to distraction. Oh, God, give them eyes to see this morning and call upon this Christ and be saved. Lord, I thank you for the joy of every believing heart here this morning that he is risen indeed. Bless them in the fullness of what that means. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.